And now, live from the CHCO Broadcast Center, this is the St. Andrews Merrill Forum with your host, Chris Fleming. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Fleming. This is a Candidates Forum presenting the two candidates offering for the position of Mayor of St. Andrews in the upcoming municipal election to be held on Monday, May the 9th. Both candidates are members of the current council. Kate Akaji, Doug Nash, thank you very much for being here. Thank, thank you, you, thank you for participating. Us. Our format this evening is a very simple one. Over the next hour, we're going to hear directly from each of the mayoral candidates. They will have up to five minutes to speak to you directly. And following that, we're going to go to a simple question and answer format. Now, you have the chance to provide the questions. If you are watching this broadcast live on Monday, April the 25th, you can call into the station at the number which should shortly be appearing on your screen. It is 529-8826. That's 529-8826. A member of staff will note down your question. Your name will not be used. And all questions will be addressed equally by each candidate so that you will hear fully from both of them. So, with that, we are going to turn to opening presentations. And following the usual alphabetic <laughs> tradition, Kate, you can oh, lead us off. Started with a Z. <laughs> thank you, Chris. I need to put these on in order to, d to read what I have written, and I'd like to thank CHCO TV for inviting me to come. I have, alwe I have always been and always will be committed to my hometown of St. Andrews, New Brunswick. For me, that means making a difference in people's lives. In St. Andrews, every person counts, no matter their income, background, or the neighborhood they call home. No one should be excluded, and everyone should be able to contribute to their full potential. So that's why I am running for your mayor. First and foremost, I graduated from UNB with the first four-year BED program and taught here in St. Andrews for all of my 30 years. All of my career and life, I have been a faithful St. Andrews promoter and very involved in our town and its people. I love to share my heritage and culture, but most of all, my town, St. Andrews by the Sea. I was born in St. Andrews on Indian Point, and although it was not always easy for my family, but thanks to our, our widowed dad, we grew to become a vibrant part of this town. We knew many families who faced much greater challenges and with hard work and commitment became permanent and loyal to St. Andrews people. That's why the core of my campaign is to bring the people of St. Andrews together. We have an opportunity to make and change the direction by moving forward in a united and open way that will help build and empower our town and ensure that it remains the greatest place to live. As a councillor and then as de your deputy mayor, I have worked diligently to make St. Andrews a wonderful place to live and raise our families. And I will continue to do so as mayor. Here's why. We only get a small portion of the taxes St. Andrews generates. The larger percentage goes to Ottawa and Fredericton, leaving us struggling to build public transportation, keep the social housing in good repair, and to support the aging infrastructure. We want St. Andrews to remain a, a safe, vibrant, and prosperous community. For this to happen and to ensure key investment and steady progress, Town Hall must become a cooperative working unit for the betterment of all in St. Andrews. My campaign is about working together for our town. Before deciding to run, I asked myself, what can we do now for a better future for tomorrow? What are the first steps we can take to get there? What is doable and what is pragmatic? Where can we get the support for council to make progress for the people of St. Andrews? As many of you know, I am a committed, hardworking, and I like to, I like to see, set realistic and achievable goals in order to get things done. I did so like on Canada Day. So, that is why I am running for your mayor, to get it done, to get results, and to move forward. 
That is what I love about public office, the opportunity to turn hopes into reality, and that is what my platform and my campaign are really all about. Everything in this pro platform is realistic, pragmatic, and doable. Everything it, in it, with your help, will take us forward as a town. When today's children are grown, the measure of our success will not be how little we did, but how much we achieved, how much progress we made, and how well we invested for their future. We owe it to the people of St. Andrews. We owe it to your children, grandchildren, and all descendants. We owe it to ourselves. Thank you, Wally Wan, and very best. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Okay, Doug. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, when I first uh, decided, after much uh, thought, that I wanted to run for mayor, and when it first became known to some of my friends that I had filed my nomination papers, someone that I think highly of came to me and said, why should I vote for you? Well, I thought that was someone who was my friend, and I thought that was kind of an odd question, but you know, I did not have an immediate answer. And it took me some while to figure out what it was that was motivating me to want to uh, run for mayor of the town. Uh, unlike Kate, my colleague, I wasn't born here. I was born in Ontario. I was educated there. I have lived in, Saint An in uh, New Brunswick since 1987 when I came here to work for the provincial government, but I've only lived in St. Andrews since 2009. But since that time, we've grown to love this place very much. My whole family loves this place. O only my oldest daughter is away now working in Ontario. The rest of my family is still here, but the answer, it still doesn't answer my question to myself of why do I want to be mayor and finally I, the only thing I had for an answer that I went back to him with was that I seem to be motivated by responsibility. When I have responsibility I do better, I feel better, I perform better and I think it's just the sense that there's a job that needs to be done and that I think that I have the uh, experience, the leadership skills and the vision to be able to help move our town forward. Um, there are lots of things that we're facing here. Uh, Kate has, has outlined many of them, but I think that one of the things that's happened is that municipal government has become much more complicated over time. We're struggling with our relationship with Fredericton, with our relationship with the, with the federal government. Um, demands become greater and greater for services and infrastructure in our town. We have a lot of catch up to do and money is much more in short supply than it once was. Um, I think that uh, over the next four years there are a number of priorities that I see that we need to go forward with but I do agree with Kate that we need to go th forward together. We need to build a consensus here. We need to find out what, what it is that people really want their community to be like. And I think we've moved in our, in our current council quite a ways towards that, but I still think that there's a long way to go. And uh, so uh, it, just in closing, in terms of my remarks, I, I'm looking forward to fielding questions from the public. And uh, just to assure you that uh, at this point, I've got 30 years uh, senior government experience in two provinces. Uh, I think I've learned a lot along the way, and I think a lot of that can be turned to the benefit of, of our community. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much to both of you. Well, now we come to the fun part, which is the questions. Now, to lead off, both of you are well aware that there has been a little exercise going on formulated by the Chamber of Commerce and the BIA called uh, St. Andrews 2020, what's your vision? Looking forward over the next four years, of course, this council will end in 2020, this new one. And um, we asked four simple questions, having people look at the existing municipal plan. And the first question we asked them was to prioritize the nine objectives which are contained in that municipal plan. The number one item that came out of there was economic development. So what I would like to put to you now is the question, what do you see as council's role in helping stimulate that economic development. Doug, we'll start with you. Yes, 
Intra that, that's actually an interesting initial finding because uh, during our term of council, this term of council, we did a strategic plan, we did look at the municipal plan, and we decided that economic development wasn't, in fact, a primary role for the municipal government to assume. And that doesn't mean that it's not important, it just means that uh, what we felt was that the private sector was primarily responsible for that, and that in fact the Chamber of Commerce and the BIA were, were really uh, engines of that uh, moving ahead. So I, I for one, am, am pleased that, that those organizations have taken this role on. However, having thought about that going into this election, I really believe that we need to reprioritize economic development for the council and the council needs to play more of a leadership role than perhaps we've played in the last uh, uh, term. And uh, I'm not exactly sure how that is going to play out and what, what needs to be done, but again, it's one of those areas that I think that uh, we've been kind of sitting on the sidelines as council and I think we need to get more involved. Kate. Well, um, I agree with Doug. Uh, we have worked hard as a council and under, um, you know, previous uh, leadership. And I was thrilled when I, when I saw that vision for 2020 that the BIA and the Chamber had, had put forth because it really made me question what, where St. Andrews will go in the next four years. and how we as a council can help them to get there. Um, I think we have to look at infrastructure, which is aging and repurposing, like I'm saying, the arena, for example, W.C. O'Neill Arena. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could repurpose that to have a walking, you know, a walking inside, walking track and a swimming pool so that our people aren't going to the Civic Center all the time, that they're here. But again, that is, um, probably a major thing that we'll have to look at and whether it can be done uh, with all the other things that we have to do as a council. I think we're rather busy, but I think in the municipal plan that we're going to work together to pr promote, um, that may be the priority, but I don't think it's the top priority of what we have. Mm -hmm. Well, since we're on the topic of money, just in this past week's Courier, there appeared a, an opinion piece drafted by one of the people who was coming back on as councillor by acclamation, who spelled out in great detail the amount of borrowing which has happened and the fiscal, perhaps a precarious fiscal position that might put the town in. One of the things that I didn't see in that article was how long this has been going on, what has the money been borrowed for, and whether this has been a fault of previous councils or whether it has been necessary work that has had to be undertaken, thus justifying that borrowing. And of course, the follow-up question is, is, is that putting a, a crimp in our ability to do further things such as you've just been mentioning, Kate. So I'll start, Kate, with, with you on that one and see where we can get. Well, first of all, I think all municipalities or towns or villages or whatever, we all have that, that money problem. And uh, as my colleague Doug said, that um, uh, government, uh, provincial and federal government have most of the money, they have the, the direction to um, assist us, and we have to we have to apply for that. But that being said, I don't think we're as bad as maybe perhaps the article uh, led us to believe. We have done things that were necessary to be done, like um, you know a new fire truck, a new a new um, sidewalk, you know uh, uh, plow. We needed to have all of those things, and, and we've looked at them. And as a council. Um, we worked on the budget many hours, long hours, and and we took the advice of um, our our staff, and we came up with what we thought felt was good for St. Andrews, not taking us too deeply into economic deficiency. I think we've done a very good job 
as this council, and we are working towards what is necessary for St. Andrews, and they are necessary projects. Whether the, they happened in a storm or whether it's stormwater management, we need to be able to do that. All right, Doug, bad borrowing, good borrowing, how do we go on from here? Well, I, th I think there are both things, but my view, having been on council for almost four years now and being responsible for most of that time for finance and administration, I believe that borrowing for a small community is a necessity. It has to be good borrowing. It has to be good borrowing for the right reasons. The thing that it was missing from the article that you referred to was any sort of sense of whether or not the people that we borrow from have any problem with us as a, as borrowers, and uh, the reality of it is is that the you know all borrowing has to be done by municipalities through the provincial government, through the Municipal Capital Borrowing Board. They have very strict criteria for who can borrow and for what, and. Uh, as to my knowledge, this community has never been turned down when borrowing. Sometimes the other aspect of that is, is sometimes you need to borrow because it's smart borrowing. We borrowed $400,000 to improve the wharf and we got $890,000 in contributions from the other two levels of government because we were willing to, in, to borrow and invest $400,000. That's good borrowing. And uh, for the most part, the thing that people lose sight of is that even though you may borrow from time to time, you're also paying off. It's just like buying a house. Most people can't save $300,000 in a sock under their bed and wait all that time. Most people who have good jobs and a track record of paying their debts can go to the bank and get money and borrow as long as the bank feels you can pay you, your uh, borrowing charges that's exactly what happens with municipalities. So I think the, uh, that particular article was, was quite misleading. I think we're in no great difficulty and, uh, in this town to borrow for things that we need to borrow to move the agenda ahead in our town. Okay. Just a reminder, questions can come from you watching at home. If you're watching on the live broadcast Monday night, you can phone 529-8826. That's 529-8826 to put your question in. Your name does not get used. We'll offer the question to both candidates so that you can hear what each has to say. One of the major things that came up legislatively in this current council most recently has been the concept of a heritage bylaw and that has had its first reading in spite of the fact that some people wanted to leave it to the new council to come in so as potential heads of a new council what is your understanding of what is being sought by the community and how would you proceed towards the goals expressed by the committee that was working on that heritage project. Doug? Well, I think the first thing, I, uh, I make no bones about the fact that I'm a supporter of having a heritage bylaw. I think it's at least 30 or 40 years overdue here. This is perhaps the most heritage sensitive uh, municipality in, in certainly in this province and perhaps throughout the country and we really haven't done a very good job of protecting our heritage. I don't want to be misunderstood here. I think that many individual people have done a wonderful job in this community protecting their heritage but it, some of it has been by accident not by design and just good luck not good management. So I think we need to move ahead. I think we also wanted to get the first reading in, at least this was my interpretation of what our council's decision was, so that it was on the order paper, so that it could go public and that people could then have another chance to have input before the fine details of the bylaw are put in place. So I'm uh, looking forward to moving that hit ahead. I think that the implementation of a heritage bylaw is one one of the top priorities that I would have in the first year of the of the new mandate. Kate, heritage bylaw. Um, first of all, I think we have the greatest resource of people who have come forward and worked on that committee. And I know um, my uh, colleague D um, Doug was part of that. And. Um, what they've brought forth and the due diligence that they've put towards it, 
and these are volunteers. We have been very fortunate that they have researched it, um, brought to our attention, uh, made us aware. Both of us are very pro-history, pro-culture, pro, -history, pro, -culture, pro um, keeping the heritage alive. And I, I'm, I'm just amazed when I, I see a group get together such as the heritage group and the work that they did and the way they presented it, the way they took it, took it to public, and allowed the people to express their opinions. They brought it back to council. I mean, this is not just a light thing to be forgotten and put aside. And I think, as Doug stated, we didn't want to see that go to the next council and it not be brought forward. So as this council, we decided that we should do the first reading so that it was there and it will go forward. And I'm hoping that it will go forward with the, to the public so that they have their opportunity again to express what is written in that bylaw. They should have the say as well. Mm -hmm. Well, since we're on the uh, topic of building and that sort of thing, uh, as you probably well know from your own experiences, there is nothing that gets people more irate than questions to do with property and what they can and cannot do on their property and so on and so forth. And I don't know how much you may have dug into all the various comments that came through on the vision uh, document. But there were some comments to the effect that how did such and such building ever come to be allowed and, and what, is the, what is going on with PAC and where are the bylaws that govern these sorts of things. These of course are comments that uh, I remember well from years and years, almost decades ago. It seems to be an ongoing issue. So I'll put the question to you. Uh, do you see a need for revisiting some of the non-heritage aspects of the various zoning, building, bylaws, and so on? Kate? I think um, we have policies and bylaws that are we need to revisit. Um, we need to um, look at them because they're not up to what the modern age has, has brought us to. But that being said, we have um, a great bylaw enforcement fellow who knows what he's talking about when these issues come up. So if you read the bylaws, and it could be our interpretation and uh, the committee's interpretation, PAC, that, you know, yeah, you can turn it over, and that's the thing that we want to look at for those policies and bylaws. We have to revisit some of them. For example, we worked on the the signage bylaw, and after it was done, I think we could have rewritten it again. You know, like, <laughs> there were things, that, there were loopholes, and as much as we would like to say, you know, you do your due diligence, uh, we can all make mistakes or we can all interpret it differently, and I think that will be a, um, a cause for us to look at it, and, and again, the municipal plan will help us through that. Doug, how do we stand as far as zoning bylaws and building bylaws and those kinds of regulations? Well, I think we need to do, <clears throat> in my belief, a major overhaul and a reconciliation of all of our bylaws. Uh, what was interesting when I first came on uh, council and I looked at some of the bylaws, it very became very clear to me, and this isn't blaming anybody, but the easiest way to get a bylaw when you don't have one is call up St. John and get them to send you yours and change what's on the top. And I'm afraid that a lot of inappropriate things or inaccurate things got into our bylaws. When you go back, going back to the housing question though, I think there are a couple of things. The, the heritage bylaw has identified a couple of very sensitive areas. One is demolition of, of houses. The other one is infill in where there are vacant lots in neighborhoods. And I think the heritage bylaw will go a long way if done properly to sort of make sure that our street capes, streetscapes be, you know, remain the way they are now because that's part of the big attraction. One of the other areas that doesn't have anything to do with heritage though is the notion that we're beginning to see issues of sea level rise and difficulties with stormwater management and that it's very clear to me, at least as a, as a non-expert, that there may well now be places within our town that are no longer buildable and those issues are going to have to be dealt with because 
as we've seen in many locations around the province, people building in areas where they might not have built and then after they get flooded out, expecting the rest of us to bail them out because they built somewhere, but the government was weak in not telling people that they couldn't build in certain places. So those, all those issues, I think, revolve around, uh, and, and it is, it's a hot button issue for people in the community. And, uh, and I think the heritage bylaw could be, but I believe that, the, as Kate does, that the committee that formulated it has gone very cautiously along that road to try to avoid some of that. Mm -hmm. All right. The next question that I have for you is about a situation that this incoming council faces that very few incoming councils have to face, and that is the fact that the chief administrative officer, what we used to call the town manager in the old days, has taken a new position, is leaving the community as of very early on in the, in the upcoming month. and. The new council is faced with the job of replacing that position. And I can remember having sat through that kind of situation myself in a previous council, and that's not an easy piece of work to find a new chief administrative officer. So I'm wondering, have you given that any thought to how to proceed with that and how long a process you envisage it being and uh, do you have any plans on bringing in any of the rest of the community to help solve that particular situation? Doug. Yes, you're right, uh, Chris. Something I wish we wouldn't have to face at this stage, uh, an election going on at the same time as the departure of uh, of a valued uh, professional employee that uh, we certainly can't function without. But uh, I, uh, I think hopefully we have already moved ahead somewhat. We're already at the stage of almost advertising for the position. Uh, we've redone the job description, et cetera, in the ad. And so this council has anticipated what the new council will have to go through, at least to some extent. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to attract another good candidate like our last uh, CAO was and turned out to be and uh, that we'll be able to put that in place within the next uh, two to three months. But it is, uh, you know, to get the right person and to commit to the right person, we want to look carefully. Okay, new CAO, how do you see that unfolding, Kate? Well, it's not a good thing when they leave at any point in time, but um, just two years ago when uh, our CAO joined us, um, so it's, it's not that long ago that we put the um, specs out, if you can say that, for um, a CAO. So as Doug alluded, um, our town council uh, decided that we should, we should put the specs out for the next CAO, saving the council that's coming in because it is a new council and we'll need maybe some guidance. Um, and we wanted to get it in there. That's not saying that we don't have the um, people that are in place that at this time can help us manage through a short term, through this interim, of not having a CAO. And um, we have well-qualified, um, wonderful staff that are going to have to fill in the void while our CAO is missing. But that doesn't mean that as councillors or as council that they're not going to try and do it not quickly because we found when you rush, you make those mistakes. So like Doug said, we need to have somebody in there that is going to fill that position and enhance us and enhance the town. And so I don't think, like us putting it out there is just because we wanted to do it in a shorter period of time, but we definitely want to look for the right fit for our town. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe if I could just interject, uh, answering the last part of your, your question is, uh, I actually see room here for 
outside people to be brought in by council to be part of the selection committee. I don't know that we've ever done that before, but I don't see that that would be an inappropriate thing to do. The new council will, there will be a committee amongst the new councillors, I would assume, as we did a search committee, but uh, I for one would uh, be open to the, to the notion of having outside uh, involvement, outside meeting, not outside of town. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about headhunters and all yeah. of that. We, we rejected that long ago. We've got all kinds of very well qualified people who live in our town who could certainly assist us in finding the right staff member. Well, it is an important position and uh, I think some uh, outside consultation or with, with non-council consultation might be of, of great benefit. Well, and also, I mean, we have the old council. There may be someone there that wants to help assist us as well mm -hmm. who did it um, in the first, mm -hmm. you know, the first session. So I think we, we are very, as Doug said, we're very fortunate to have the experienced people that we have. Well, it's a sort of a follow-up question to that since we're talking about management and council. Again, going back to my own experience in, in council and so on, in a number of cases, I would find that it was sometimes difficult for members of council to understand what exactly their role was and that councillors sometimes see themselves as managers. So I'm going to put the question to you, what do you see as the connection or the working model of having, he's now called or she is now called the chief administrative officer, but a town manager, the person who is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. What is that role between manager and council? Kate? Um, the CAO, I think, is the one that um, we as council look for, for answers to the things that are, um, you know, uh, <laughs> town related, not town related, but um, uh, staff related. They manage the staff and the protocol that happens and we as a council make those decisions that as to the final decision as to what is actually going to happen. But our CIO is the one who gives us the background and the references and the and the understanding to what is going on uh, for any decisions that we have to make or um, anything that you know, needs to be done by the town staff. He's the communicator to the council, or she is, whichever it will be, is the communicator to our council. And I think they they also keep us, you know, on track as to what um, projects or what needs to be done, and hopefully um, we get more done as as the time goes on. I think. So, Doug, the relationship between CAO and council, how do you see it? Well, I, pretty much the same way. I think the CAO is the, is the uh, operational manager of the town. But the CAO's responsibility is to carry out the decisions of council. And council's responsibility is not to micromanage the CAO or the, uh, and the CAO, CAO's staff. And, and I have seen some rough spots by times where, where that tends to happen. I think councillors can be very zealous and uh, we want them that way. That's the way they should be. But not to the extent that they're, they're doing operational things within the town you know you need to distance yourself and it's it's somewhat difficult if you've had a, if you come from an administrative background or an operational management background uh, as I have you you really do have to step back and say you know if it was me I'd just be going in there and telling this person to do this but you can't do that and and uh, and you shouldn't do it it's you're not supposed to do it and it's destructive if you do do it so you really have to be careful but I, I agree with what Kate has said we we rely heavily on the CAO one of the problems in, in the past is that we have not had a well-rounded other staff. We've had the CAO being the, the chief cook and bottle washer and doing almost everything themselves because we haven't had other subordinate staff. I think the fact that we were able in this council to 
uh, acquire a very well qualified uh, manager of uh, develop planning and development is is a great boon to the CAO because it's a specialized area that we were completely without almost in the past someone who had those credentials and ability to do that so I think that's going to make it somewhat easier for the CAO but I think it's it's always a learning curve and it will be for the new council to make sure that they understand that they don't need to run the town they need to run the higher level policy of the town that's that's what they're elected for mm -hmm. Chris, yes certainly um, years ago there was just the mayor and one other person I think we had somebody who came in and he said look he said you know there was the mayor and there was the town manager and that was it in this office and now you've gone and here you've hired all these people <laughs> well you know times are changing and we need to have those people in the proper places that are going to assist us to make the, re the regulations and the views of the town more aware, you know, to be aware of that. But I, I had to laugh when he came in and he said, well, it was just the mayor sat down with you and the, and the town manager sat down with you and you had a conversation. Well, now you've put up this wall, you've done this. And so we have to look at that, that we, we need assistance when the government is changing, while we're changing, we need all the help that we can have and we're very fortunate to have the staff that we have that is super I would have to agree with you Kate Sorry. I think uh, I think things have become a lot more complicated than they used to be when I started it was the town manager and two employees and uh, things have things have got a lot more complicated since then well on to other matters one of the recent activities that's taking place in town has been talk about establishing a food bank and probably we can say right off it's even unfortunate that we have to be talking about such things but the need has certainly made itself plain and a question has come in that asks what role could council play in that perhaps a piece of property could be um, I can't read this word. <laughs> I can't be donated. I'm not yes. sure. Yes. Uh, okay. Given. Yes. Okay. As an example. So, uh, how do you see that going? Uh, I've lost track. Kate, I'll start with you. I went, I went to the food bank meeting, <laughs> and it was very well run, and listened carefully to what has to be done. It is a shame that we we have to get to have to have a food bank, but it is a necessary thing that we need in St. Andrews. Um, the stories that we heard and the places, and I think what they were asking from the town, and I, I could be wrong with this and may have the wrong interpretation, but again, it's my interpretation is that, yes, they're looking for a building or a place which to house the food bank. I think they will have the volunteer support because the number of people that showed up that night was phenomenal. and. The, the talk and the discussion that went on um, about people that really need the food bank. Um, I really think it is a necessity for St. Andrews and I'm really looking forward that, you know, that we will have one. For Council's uh, part, um, we are building heavy in some instances, but then you have to look at the maintenance and again, we're money poor. So when you look at that, we have to work to find the right balance for having the food bank, but again, not um, being um, overly indulged with, you know, monetarily. Um, I know in St. Stephen, they have an uh, the Charlotte County uh, food bank with Donna Linton is great, and the one in St. George is also doing very well. And um, I just think it's what we need to do for this for this day and this age at this time. And I'm hoping that council will be on board for it. So Doug, how do you see yeah, things going I, I forward? I see it the same way. I think it's unfortunate. I think it's not unexpected to me. I mean, you know, some people have the image that this town is a, a city on a hill, you know, glowing with gold or whatever, but it, it's just like any other town. They're, they, you know, we're very fortunate. We have a very large tax base here for the size of our town. Uh, we have a very large budget for a municipality with 1,800 full-time residents, 
but it doesn't mean that there aren't people who need our help all the time. And uh, I, would, I would concur. I, I, don't, I don't have a direct answer. I don't know what building or whether the town would be in a position to do that, but I think we certainly would, it behooves us to look at that very seriously. I also think that there are lots of private partners who may well uh, come forward and maybe there's some sort of an arrangement that can be made with a private organization or a private company that has space and maybe the town can contribute in some way. Uh, I don't think we want to own any more than we're owning, but we do want to own the right kind of properties. And uh, and I know one of the things that, uh, you know, not to digress, but one of the things that our new manager of planning and development has said to council already, this council, is that most communities are getting into the notion, into the area of land banking because you don't want to have nothing to offer at a time when an opportunity comes along because you don't have any land. Now, I don't know if it fits this, this, model, this particular problem or not, but just another thing that we need to start to think about. And I think um, our community is a very caring community. When, you, when we have someone who is in need, um, everybody pulls together and uh, phenomenal amounts are raised either through churches or individuals or people that are concerned and I think that's one of the great things of our town is that this food bank is a necessity and people see that as a necessity and I think as they do always they will pull together and and uh, it'll be done. Okay. Thank you. Just a reminder that your questions are more than welcome. If you're watching the broadcast live on this Monday evening, you can phone 529-8826. That's 529-8826 and give your question. The, uh, the question will be put into the studio here. Your name will not be used. And of course, as you've seen already, each candidate will have a chance to answer. Well, someone was listening very intently to our opening question on economic development, but put in a follow-up and said, what form would that take? Specifics, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doug, I'm going to throw that right over okay. to you. Well, look, uh, I've already, uh, one step back, uh, one of the things our, new, our, our current CAO, who's soon going to depart us, was marveled at when he got here a little while was how many committees that we have in this town compared to where he came from, <laughs> where there were seemingly much less. Having said that though, uh, I believe that we probably do need an economic development committee to pull together the right people at the table to advise us, especially through the process of the municipal plan. But beyond that, the, we need something more on the ground for economic development. One of the things that, that many people don't want to face, I think, and I perhaps am putting myself in peril here by saying so, is that the provincial government looks finally like they want to do something about a more regional government uh, network and, uh, and to change the, the face of local governance. And uh, when it comes to economic development, that's going to factor into it. Uh, it's very difficult. We, uh, you know, I always hear people saying to me, you know, are we a retirement community? Are we a tourism uh, destination? Well, I think we're both, but I think we want to be more than that. We want to have younger families. We want to have some work for people to do here more than, than what we have. And I think that the, uh, I, I've been very impressed with the committee structure. As Kate was saying in the Heritage Committee, that was the first time we brought the right organizations together at the table to deal, to deal with the problem. I think it worked famously well, and I think the same thing could apply to economic development. Okay. Kate, specifics on economic development. What do you see happening? Well, what I have seen, the BIA and the Chamber working together on the vision, um, and the CCRTCA, right? I think I got the right initials. Um, it's always difficult. I know. CCRTA. <laughs> CCRTA. They have worked really well on uh, some of the economic things, like the cruise ships initiatives and all of those things, to bring a more broader base to our community. And I think it's great to see that they're working together, like the BIA and the Chamber, um, looking towards those visions, asking the right questions, um, you know, trying to um, help us 
with the municipal plan that will help us economically um, to make decisions for um, for St. Andrews for um, the outlying areas. I know um, Doug has, has stated that uh, government wants us to be a more regional system and it is going to impact us um, a lot and uh, we're going to need to look at that um, what's best for St. Andrews and the outlying areas. All right. One of the comments that came in several times over in the vision exercise was to do with the arena. And that's been a topic of great conversation in the community over quite a number of years now. And the feeling is or the, the thing could be summed up by saying is that too much of a building now for us or can we do something in order to maximize the use of it and get it to a point where we actually do use it and derive benefit from it. Kate I'll start with you. From the past council we've looked at it as um, well you know repurposing it like We've, uh, because of the number of people that we've hired, we've had to revamp the town hall that's downtown for more offices for the people that we have employed. So therefore, we needed uh, council chambers, we needed uh, you know, a meeting room, and so the arena has been repurposed for some of those areas. Um, the arena board has looked at uh, many things. I myself would like to see the arena um, be repurposed. As I've stated before, I think we need to keep our young families and people exercising and whatnot here, and so maybe we need to look at it. Probably the first thing that we have to do is we've been band-aiding this poor, band-aiding, is that a word? Um, putting, a, putting, <laughs> putting a band-aid on this building, and I think, um, you know, we need to look at it. It needs a new roof. It, you're right, there's a lot of expenditures. Um, if we can uh, get a vision for what we can do with this, and, and I think that has to come through the manager and through the people as to what we can use it for. I'd like to see the young people come back. I'd like to see a walking track. I'd like to see a swimming pool, but that's just my own personal. I want to be able to go here instead of driving the 20 miles away and uh, you know having to do the exercise and whatnot there. Let's try and keep our people here. All right, Doug, the arena, how do you see it? Well, I, I agree. I think there was a certain point in time, but we're past that, where we might have gone in a different direction. But we've already invested so much in the arena. I mean, we've spent close to $800,000 on the fire suppression system. No choice of ours, directed completely by the provincial government. All of that is there now. The other thing I would say about this is that, you know, uh, and, and uh, this occurred to me when I first came on board on council, that there was a time when the arena was a lot more self-sufficient than it was because of the generous donations that we got when it was built. Uh, that those times have passed, and I did say facetiously one day at a meeting that uh, the Trojans thought the wooden horse was a pretty neat gift at first, right? And so we're, we, the times have changed. You know, things that cost $80 to buy to replace, you know, 50 years ago now cost $800 to replace. So we're, we're really in a tough situation, but I think we need to go forward. I think we need to repurpose it. I think we need to find other ways of using it. The other thing I, I think I, I don't mind saying is that is that this arena is filled up lots of times with people who don't live in town. They pay taxes, but their tax dollars don't go to support this arena. They, we want them to use our arena. We don't want to charge a toll coming into town like they proposed in St. John. Uh, that's, that's nonsense. We don't want that. But what we do want is a fair share of taxation from Fredericton so that we can create the kinds of facilities that everybody in our area can use. Well, yes, Kate. One more thing is, this is we've, we as a council, past council, um, made this our emergency medical, uh, our emergency medical 
unit, right? For when we have, like we used the biological station. Now this is this building has been designated, and we're putting in the generator and all of that, and the facilities that should arise, like we had that big storm, and we needed to have a place. Then the people could come here, and I think we need to continue to look at that because we're now having those, you know, those ten-year storms are now mm -hmm. two-year storms or a year or two months. So we need to look at that. Well, Doug, in in your comments, you uh, you raised the lovely specter of regionalization, and of course, we know that the province has been angling after that for quite some period of time now, and uh, we have word that a new form of Municipalities Act is going to come upon us. We haven't heard many specifics of what that's going to contain, but yet we know that changes are coming, and we already have the Regional Service Commission. And if you read the paper at all, <laughs> or listen to the news, I don't know how much play it's gotten on on-air news, but if you read the paper, certainly you read story after story about, well, let's put it bluntly, the shambles that the current Regional Service Commission operating in our district is, is operating under. And I'm simply wondering how do you look, or how are you looking forward, if you're elected mayor, to working on that Regional Services Commission? Doug, I'll start with you. Oh, that's a tough one, you know. The first thing that came to my mind was getting a root canal. But, <laughs> but having said that, I think that there is possibility there, but I really think that it was an interim step of the government to do something because they weren't at the stage where they could go forward with some sort of a regional, a full regional concept. And again, I don't mean to be facetious, but uh, it's been very tough for the people that have been on the, on the commission. Uh, I've been fortunate that I haven't been exposed too much to the commission, but I have been on the uh, regional policing committee, the community policing committee that was set up by the Regional Service Commission. Mayor Chaptiani and I have served on that. That's been an excellent forum to deal with policing issues and it involves private citizens, it involves the representatives from the local service districts and it involves municipalities. But my fundamental problem with the Regional Service Commission is that it's essentially anti-democratic. You know, the mayors of communities that are duly elected like we're facing here sit on the committee and get one vote and people who showed up at the, at the, uh, at the local hall in, the, in a local service district and said they'd volunteer to be on the lo regional service commission get an equal vote. That's just anti-democratic. If you had a proper regional government, then if you had smaller, larger municipalities that took in the outlying areas, everyone would elect all their representatives and the mayor of that new unit would be a member of the Regional Service Commission. So you'd have nine people in our region, you'd have nine people serving on the commission at a very high level and they'd represent all of the municipalities and local service districts uh, by election which is the proper process. Well, Kate, how do you see yourself confronting the Regional Service Commission? Because I was deputy mayor, I got to go to the Regional Service Commission when the mayor was away. And at the beginning, it was a work in progress and it was very difficult um, to attend those meetings. Many didn't go because of the length of the meetings and the disruptions. But I think they have worked very hard to um, get to a stage where it's a lot easier to go. The last one that I attended when the mayor was away was much better than I had been in previous times. And um, I was glad to see that it had progressed that well. And with Duggan and um, Mayor Chaptiani on the Policing Commission, it was nice to see a committee like that that was formed underneath this Regional Service Commission. They sometimes get a bad rap for, for the things that they're doing, but they are trying to work through the protocol and um, all the people and the dynamics, as, as Doug has stated. I mean, the fact that, you know, our town gets one vote and you got LSDs that are there is, and just show up, you're right. We're elected and we, you know, there should be more decisions made by the mayors and their representatives 
than uh, maybe um, a local service district representative. But I have to say that um, our regional service commission, as much as they're getting the bad PR in the, in the news, um, they are working to try and make the betterment for their regional service commission, for our regional service commission. Mm -hmm. So is this the future? A regional service commission? Or something like? I think the government is, is, is was pushing that way. I'm not sure whether or not we're all on board with it, like whether the local service districts and the municipalities are all on board on amalgamating everybody together, because there are pros and cons, and I think, um, I'm not uh, speaking for Doug, but for myself, I think we have to look at those and we have to get all the parties involved to hear what their aspect is. I've never lived out in, the, you know, in an LSD, a uh, local service district, and I've lived in, inside a municipality. So my lifestyle, my beliefs are totally different than someone who's out in the local service district. And I'm sure they don't want to become, well, one of the big things would be the increase in taxes. And that is a, a big issue for some of them, you know, for a lot of them, sorry. So Doug, do you see a way forward either, either through the Regional Service Commission or through some other mechanism yeah. to <clears throat> enlarge the scope and, and deal with the kinds of situations you were referencing with the arena? Yeah, I do. Um, I think one of the first things we need to do in the first year of the next mandate of the town, because I don't think this is going to happen overnight, even though now I think it's closer than it was earlier in the mandate. At least the provincial government is making noises that they want to do something now. But they still want to do this voluntarily. And I, and I don't disagree with that. If we can get everybody together. But even within the town, I expect that there are people that would think that our money from taxes would end up going out there if, in fact, we were amalgamated or, or somehow had some relationship with the local service districts. And so I think we need to do a business case to see if it makes sense. I, I, I have some notion that it does. I have two concerns about the way we're sitting right now. I'm very concerned that our, our water supply in our town it, it exists in an area that we have absolutely no control over. Mm -hmm. And secondly, from the point of view of economic development, there is an underutilized industrial park and a marine depot on the St. Croix River that is in an LSD that we again have no use of in terms of the what we might want to do for economic development for this whole for this whole region. That's just two examples. I wanted to make a comment that uh, following on what Kate said about taxation, I think people that are duly uh, concerned about the fact that that if they were part of a bigger uh, unit, they'd have to pay the same taxes as the highest taxes that are paid in our town, and I think that's just not true. But no one has explained that to them and said, "Look, there are there are big municipalities where the outlying areas of the municipality have a different mill rate than the people who have all the services in the center of the municipality." There's there's all kinds of taxation schemes that can be implemented that are fair and uh, and affordable. Okay. We're down to our last couple of minutes, and we've discussed a number of things. So my final question to you both, is there an issue that you've got in your mind that we haven't talked about this evening that you would like to make a comment on? Kate, I'll start with you. Hmm. Is there an issue that I think is in my mind? Um, I'd have to say that I, I, I want to see the things that we started as a council finished, like the seniors housing project, mm -hmm. like the heritage. Um, some of the things that were started by the previous council are things that need to continue and, and move forward. And I'm hoping that um, the next council will look at it. Um, also for economic development, I'd like to see our town prosper. And I think in my mind, I think we can only do that if we work together. And I think as a, as a town, uh, as a municipality, as a community, we need to work that way. All right, Doug. One of the things that we did not get around to uh, in our, we talked about around the edges, but was to deal with health care in our community. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, we're down to one 
practicing doctor here. We have a health, a so-called health center, but it's really a doctor's office with one doctor. No disrespect to Dr. Peer. We don't want to annoy Dr. Peer. He's a great doctor. But we need to look at the long-term thing. We're in the process. We had two doctors. We lost one. There doesn't seem to be any strategy from the provincial government down that gets down to our level to get us another doctor since we had two and now we have one. Do we need two doctors or we do we need some sort of more comprehensive health system in place? I always am concerned about the number of community college students that we have from, who come from far, far away in some cases. We have no on-site ability by way of medical services. We have no after-hours clinic many other small communities do and we're competing with other communities to get doctors. Mm -hmm. Well thank you so much for those comments from both of you I very much appreciate having had you here this evening and you've been very generous with your time Kate Akaji, Doug Nash. I will say best of luck to each of you on the election, although only one can win. But we know, we know that. <laughs> and thank you very much for your participation from home. I hope you found something useful in this broadcast. I'm Chris Fleming. Good night.